Take 666. Happy Halloween and welcome to This Be The Verse. In lieu of a lip sync, I'm going to read Edgar Allan Poe's beautifully haunting poem, The Raven. We're coming to you from an undisclosed location somewhere between the sub-sub-sub basement of PS 75, the Emily Dickinson School, and the very spot on the Upper West Side of Manhattan where Edgar Allan Poe actually wrote The Raven. In the summer of 1844, Edgar Allan Poe was invited by Mr. and Mrs. Patrick Brennan to their country house on 216 acres of land in what was then the countryside, which is right now the Upper West Side. It was 216 acres of land between the Central Park and the Hudson River. And there, Edgar Allan Poe wrote and finished The Raven. One look at the house, and you can see how inspiring it could be for a dark and stormy night kind of poem. Poe considered himself first and foremost a poet, but he also wrote fiction and in fact created what is considered the prototype for the detective story. Besides that, he was a tremendously astute literary critic, and one of his most famous essays is called The Philosophy of Composition, in which he delineates his very detailed method of writing the poem The Raven. He didn't go in for any of that wishy-washy, vague, inspiration kind of thing. Poe sets out in detail the hard, hard work of writing a poem and gives us a tremendous amount of detail about his method and how he wanted to get a singular effect with this poem. He even goes so far as to tell us that the meter of the raven is octameter acatalectic, alternating with heptameter catalectic, repeated in the refrain of the fifth verse and terminating with tetrameter catalectic. Of course he does. One last thing before we begin the poem. Edgar Allan Poe was a complete failure his entire life. He made almost no money from his writing, and The Raven was the only poem that ever really got any kind of success. It wasn't until the 1850s when Charles Baudelaire translated his work into French that Poe's work got its due. Now, let's begin with The Raven, this amazing poem by a poet who one critic called the poet of unripe boys and unsound men. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor," I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. "'Only this, and nothing more." Ah, distinctly, I remember, it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here, I opened wide the door. 
darkness there and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken and the stillness gave no token and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice, let me see then what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonium shore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such name as nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken, doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock in store, caught from some unhappy master whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore of never, nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy and to fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by a seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee, respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. 
Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, whether tempter sent or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonium shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. Happy, Happy Halloween. Halloween.